This is a piece of modern art, yet its image would have been as recognisable and as powerful to a medieval onlooker as it is to us. Unlike this sculpture, though, a piece of contemporary music would strike our medieval ancestors as shockingly alien and bizarre. Of all art forms, it's Western European music that has become so utterly different and separate from its equivalents in other cultures, taking during the Christian Middle Ages an unprecedented and decisive turn. In this series, I'm going to look at five of the great breakthroughs that European music has experienced in its extraordinary history, five momentous moments of discovery. I also want to show what they mean to us today, at a time when so-called classical music is being absorbed into a much bigger mainstream, and when its thousand-year reign seems to be coming to a close. Imagine a world without music. A world without Handel's Messiah or Mozart's Requiem, without Beethoven's symphonies, without Carmen, Duke Ellington, or the Verve's urban hymns. The Big Bang that made possible the astonishing scope and richness of European music was the invention of notation, the technique of writing music down. In this film, I'm going in search of the medieval musicians who took that first momentous step a thousand years ago. We're looking down a corridor of time. At the other end of it are a handful of monkish scribes and harassed librarians trying to record on pig and sheepskin parchment in the frozen silence of the Dark Ages the learning and civilization bequeathed to them by the Romans. They live in a barbaric and illiterate age. It is the era of grim bastard and rapacious yob. To the east lies the exotic grandeur of the Byzantine Empire, to the south a confident and sophisticated Islam. The culture of Western Europe, on the other hand, is at a dangerously low ebb. monasteries of the first Christian millennium, the only music they had left from the Roman period were the memorised chants of Gregorian plainsong. The preservation of chant through a purely oral tradition for so long against such heavy odds was nothing short of miraculous. Then in around 1000 AD, a great leap was made from memory to the page. Music began to be written down. A thin trickle of notes became a river, then a flood. So much music of such diversity came bursting forth that it's scarcely possible to believe that it all stems from a dramatic breakthrough made by just a few monks all those centuries ago. that our music can be easily written down is fundamental to its success and spread. 
none of the world's other musical cultures have ever developed a comparable notation. This is the beginning of a unique story. Whenever European culture tried to reinvent itself, it looked to the culture of ancient Greece. The Greeks loved music as we do and had plenty of it. Unfortunately, though, they didn't have a reliable method of writing their music down. So although various abstract textbooks survived, monastic musicians of the Dark Ages didn't have a clue what Greek music actually sounded like. Amazingly, this didn't stop them trying, through painful trial and error, to build a musical system based on the Greeks' theories. It was as if they were deep-sea divers searching for some hidden shipwreck with only the ship's original design drawings to go on and no indication at all as to which ocean to begin the search in. Culturally and musically speaking, it must have felt to those medieval monks as if they were operating in a kind of void. What they did have was plain chant, which had developed, like Christianity itself, from Judaism. This thin flame is Europe's only living, continuous musical link with the centuries before Christ. The Abbey of Sant'Antimo was founded in the 8th century, and monks still sing here at least twice a day as they did then. This isn't just pleasing mood music, though, as it's so often perceived today, nor a sort of soothing aromatherapy for the ears. Plain chant is, and was in the Middle Ages, the musical expression of Christian faith. It isn't a woolly spiritualism, but the actual words of the Mass, the Psalms, the hymns and the scriptures. What it constituted was a vast mental library of melodies to cover every service for every day of the year. In the 7th century, Pope Gregory the Great, hence the name Gregorian Chant, ordered a codification of the entire chant repertoire so that the whole territory of Christian Europe should sing from the same hymn book, as it were. Now this sounds a lot easier than it was. Though they had the words written down, these poor monks had to keep in their heads all the music, which meant that every note of every chant had to be taught parrot fashion. We're talking here of something like 80 hours worth of music, the equivalent of memorising the complete works of Beethoven and Wagner put together without the help of music notation. I wonder how modern church musicians would cope with that kind of challenge. To find out, I plunged the choir of Salisbury Cathedral into the Dark Ages by the simple method of removing all their printed music. Memorising a couple of thousand chants not only took half a lifetime to achieve, it also had one or two serious drawbacks. The excellent choristers of Salisbury Cathedral are now going to help me demonstrate one of these flaws. I'm going to sing a little tune to Richard, the head chorister here, and he's going to sing it to another chorister and then another chorister after that and so on down the line. When it comes back at the end, will it be the same tune? Or will it be a case of Gregorian whispers? OK, Richard. So it's already quite different after just two hearings. It's a different length, different pitch and a different speed. If trained choristers like these find it difficult, imagine what it was like in Gregorian times with only illiterate peasant children as raw material.
la 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 Another way people tried to teach the tunes was to have one choir master with a good memory waving his wrists around to indicate what direction the tune was going in. Clearly, the need to find some kind of written aid for the memory was becoming a pressing priority for the musical monks of medieval Europe. By the time the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne ordered his codification and revising of the Gregorian chant in around 800, a crude system of squiggles and symbols had begun to emerge which were to be the forerunners of proper musical notation. These were called neumes. To find out exactly what a neum is, we need to visit the heart of Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire. In the foothills of the Swiss Alps lies one of medieval Europe's greatest centres for the copying and dissemination of chants, the Abbey of St Gallen. It was totally rebuilt in the 18th century, as you can see from this spectacular Baroque library, with its delicate and super shiny floor. Even then, though, they were aware of the amazingly precious and rare medieval manuscripts from the time of Charlemagne that were in their possession. Hi. Hi. Fantastic. This 1,200-year-old book is the earliest surviving example of Christian Europe's attempts to write music down. It's also extremely fragile. Now, if you look above the Latin text here, you'll see various lines, marks and symbols, almost like some kind of shorthand. Well, these are the neumes, and neumes are a primitive attempt to show the contour and shape of the melody you're supposed to be singing above these words. Neumes come in a huge variety. Every region of Europe, practically every monastery even, has its own particular style of neum. These St. Gallen ones here look like French acute, grave and circumflex accents. Indeed, some scholars think that's how neumes originated in the first place. Another explanation is that they are graphic representations of hand signals and gestures that a conductor might use to show singers what note to sing next. Now, looking at the neumes themselves, the ordinary single note is often represented by just a dot, like in Morse code here. Um, if you want to sing a note that goes ha, ah, that's one note followed by another going upwards, then you'd use this sign, which looks like a tick, or a grave accent followed by an acute accent. This sign here, that looks like a croquet hoop, is in fact the opposite of that, a note followed by the one below it, ha. Ah, ah. So you see, there is a sort of logic to it. But neumes have a fatal flaw. They give you the outline of the melody you're singing, but they don't tell you where you're starting from, nor how the different tunes relate to each other. Neumes are a bit like a map, which has the shape of the roads on it, but none of the road names or numbers. A map without north, south, east or west. Pretty unhelpful, really. Unless, of course, you already know the tune you're singing and you just want to jog your memory. That's what neumes are best at reminding you of a tune you already know, not showing it to you for the first time. The inadequacy of neumes was a problem for all the abbeys and cathedrals of Europe. Then, out of northern Italy, came the Big Bang, an idea that turned the humble neumes into agents of dynamic change. And this was that big idea, 
a thin red line. The red line acted as a fixed reference pitch for the notes to lock onto. Now you knew where your tune started and where it ended, simply by looking at where the notes were in relation to the red line. This is a hymn to St Cecilia, the patron saint of music. And what you're looking at in this 900-year-old manuscript is the moment frozen in time where Western music took its first great leap forward. A thin red line. We don't know who thought of it first, but we do know who saw its significance and potential and put it on the musical map. His name was Guido Monaco, and legend has it he may have ended his days in this monastery of Fonte Avalana in northern Italy. Now, a modest red line may not seem all that remarkable at first glance, but it is nonetheless music's equivalent of the printing press or sliced bread. It's therefore about time we found out a bit more about the geezer who was responsible for it, Guido of Arezzo. History hasn't left us too many clues about Guido Monaco, Guido the monk, except that his reputation as an innovative singing teacher led to his being headhunted by the Bishop of Arezzo. Guido came here to work in about 1020. Thanks to his revolutionary methods, his fame spread across Christian Europe. The fact that Guido, the man who gave us musical notation, is hardly a household name, can hardly be blamed on Arezzo, the handsome Tuscan university town where he lived and worked for many years. Despite the fact Arezzo has quite a few famous sons to celebrate, the poet Petrarch, the Renaissance biographer Vasari, and the artist Piero della Francesca, to name but three, they haven't forgotten their lone musical genius. Indeed, in the late 19th century, in a burst of civic pride, they rediscovered him in a big way. Alas, much of the 19th century Guidoniana doesn't bear much historical scrutiny. This house, for example, proclaims proudly that Guido was born and worked here. One of the few things about his life that scholars can now say for certain is that neither statement is in fact true. One thing we can be sure of is that Guido came here, because this ruin of foundations is all that's left of the cathedral he worked in in the 1020s. They built another cathedral a century later on the opposite hill. This building was demolished in the 16th century by Cosimo de' Medici to show the people of Arezzo how jolly macho he was. It was in this building that Guido set up a choir school soon to become famous throughout Italy. Broadly speaking, his methods are still in use today. Guido's choristers, who sang here in this very building every day, were the first people ever to read music at sight from the page. That someone could sing a tune they'd never heard before simply by looking at squiggles and dots on paper was considered one of the great marvels of the time. Guido wrote two medieval blockbusters on the teaching of singing. The most influential, Micrologus, he wrote here in Arezzo. In them, he demonstrated his new aligned method of notation that made the reading of notes utterly simple and clear. His biggest idea was the washing line principle. He drew one straight red horizontal line, like that. And he called this F. He said this would always represent the note F. So he put an F at the front of it like that. Now, nowadays, we'd call that a clef, French word for key, and Guido invented it. So, a blob on the line meant sing the note F, la. And a blob above the line meant sing the next note up, la, G. And a blob below the line meant sing the note below, E. La. 
Now, I know this seems fantastically simple to us, but then so does the wheel, and it took mankind a long time to figure that out. Eventually, he added another line in fetching yellow above it, which represented the note C, and a third line between the two, which represented the note A. And the spaces between them were G and B. So you had F, G, A, B, C. And here are those lines copied out in a copy of his book, Micrologus. And all you had to do was follow the blobs on the washing line, grazie Roberto, and you could read the notes one after another, easy as pie. La da di la 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 di 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 Written notation was the theory, and a darn good one too, but Guido as a singing teacher wanted to help his choristers in practice. He wanted his pupils to be able to hear in their heads the relative pitch of notes, to develop an instinct for how high or low a given note, A, B, D, G, would be. You see, to sing a tune properly, you have to be able to recognise instantly the distance between two notes. For example, when we sing, should all acquaintance be forgot, that first leap, should all, we know is four notes, not five, should all, or for that matter, seven, should all. Now those leaps are called intervals, and Guido had a novel way of remembering them. Here's a clue. Do, a deer, a female deer, a a drop of golden sun. Me a name I call myself, far a long way to run. It was Guido who invented the Do, Re, Mi singing scale we all so enjoyed in The Sound of Music. It's still in use today as a means of teaching children to sing, just as it was nearly a thousand years ago when Guido first came up with it. A dear, a female dear, a drop of golden sun. To pick up some more clues about this remarkable, elusive figure and to see his Do Re Mi singing scale in action, I visited the small hillside village of Tala, 30 kilometres from Arezzo, where, legend has it, Guido was born. A veritable Guido shrine has been lovingly created high above the town. The vice mayor, the curator of the museum, the policeman, and the town clerk took me up to see their exquisite Guido Museum. Tala may not have much scholastic hard evidence for its claim on Guido, but its welcome for the Guido tourist is second to none. Gosh, this is the museum? Yes, welcome to our little museum. Thank you. Oh, what's this display here? The museum, though small, isn't short of state-of-the-art lighting wizardry. In the Middle Age, violin, yeah. you have the guitar, you have the... Right. Yeah, and the tambourine? The tambourine. All yes, the parts the of the orchestra. Yes, of course. <laughs> Aha! And here is Guido's singing system in handy kit form against the wall. Like Maria in The Sound of Music, Guido taught his choristers a little ditty that he'd made up. His song, Ut Queant Laxis, wasn't quite as catchy as hers, and his choristers didn't wear lederhosen either. But never mind, the idea was the same. Now, the names ut, re, mi, fa, sol, la are the first syllables of each of the Latin phrases of this memorable hymn. Guido's system was actually called ut re mi, not do re mi, by the way. But that's another story. I think you'll agree that the phrase ut a deer, a female deer, doesn't have quite the same ring to it. Now, each of the phrases begins with a different note, and the notes are arranged in a neat ladder from bottom to top, low to high. Ut re mi fa sol la, and tea, a drink with jam and bread, was added later, in case you're wondering. If I press this handy knob here, 
A group of monks, forever trapped behind this wall, will sing the whole phrase in Latin. <laughs> In order to help his singers with the new ut re mi system, he even devised a trick whereby each of the notches on the fingers of your hand represented a different note of the scale. It was called the Guidonian hand. A bit like having a pocket calculator with you at all times. In fact, Guido didn't know which of his three techniques, lines notation, ut re mi, or the curious finger device would be the most useful. But gradually, all over Christian Europe, it was his four-lined stave that became universally adopted. By the 12th century, all chant books looked pretty much like this one, with the standard four lines so that anyone anywhere with the right training and a bit of gumption could read the tune. The fifth line that we're familiar with, by the way, was added for other sorts of music in the 14th century. What Guido was trying to do was cut down the learning of the Gregorian chant from 10 years to one. He himself had been a chorister. Indeed, the people of Tala suggest that he might have begun his life in the church as a young lad in this 10th century settlement, the Badia di Santa Trinita, hidden away deep in the Pratomagno woods high above the town. This is what Guido himself wrote. Therefore, I have decided, with God's help, to write this book in such a way that any intelligent and studious person may learn the chant by means of it. Should anyone doubt that I am telling the truth, let him come to learn and see that small boys can do this under our direction, boys who until now have been beaten for their gross ignorance of the Psalms. Guido's methods certainly revolutionised the teaching of singing, but what he could never have foreseen was that his new lined notation would have one other dramatic effect on the course of Western music, making it truly a big bang. Because it could now be written down, a much more sophisticated variety of music could exist that didn't rely on one person's memory. In other words, Guido paved the way for the emergence of a new, distinct species of musician, composers. Before the advent of notation, European music, like all the others in the world, was basically an improvised form in the hands of skilled performers. After Guido, the responsibility shifted dramatically from the performer to the new breed of specialist composer. Anonymous church musicians had already started experimenting with a primitive form of harmony. But the ability to see the notes laid out graphically on the page vastly accelerated the growth of a technique whereby one combined two voice lines together, two simultaneous tunes, that is, or counterpoint. <laughs> It took composers about another 200 years to pluck up the courage to write three lines together. Another 150 years later, they could manage four parts, which became something of a standard for the next few centuries.
Of course, adventurous composers mixed and matched the parts, so you could have a bit of solo, a bit of two-part, a bit of three-part, a bit of four-part, and so on, all in one piece. Works of great beauty followed. One of them, Allegri's Miserere, was thought by the Pope to be too powerful and spiritually disturbing for ordinary mortals, and he decreed that it should only be performed once a year by his own choir. Making a copy of the piece would be punished by excommunication, and the masters were kept under lock and key in the Vatican. However, the Pope had not reckoned with the ability of a 14-year-old boy to hear the piece once, then return to his lodgings and write the entire thing out from memory. It lasts, by the way, about 15 minutes. He then smuggled the illegal copy of the music out of Rome and thereby cheekily broke the official embargo. The young man in question was Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. No notation, no Mozart. No Mozart, no miserere. Here is the choir of Christchurch Cathedral, Oxford, and an extract from Allegri's Miserere May. Composers were able to create music that couldn't possibly have been conceived just through spontaneous playing. What's more, they were able to construct forms and shapes for long pieces that were way, way beyond the capabilities of a normal person's short-term memory. Perhaps architecture is the best analogy. With the right materials and a bit of DIY nous, I can make a workman's shed without any kind of plan or drawing. But there's no way I could build the cathedral next to it without the benefit of an architect's drawings, without a graphic and detailed plan. A piece of musical architecture needs every bit as intricate a drawn-up plan as Salisbury Cathedral must once have had. From the birth of Homo sapiens to the time of William the Conqueror, Music basically consisted of a tune with rhythmic accompaniment. But from Guido's invention onwards, the speed of change and the development of music has been, by comparison, dizzyingly fast. 
I don't think he realised quite what a genie he was letting out of his lamp, giving music a grid to work on and thereby making billions of harmonic combinations possible. As the centuries rolled by, music scores became more and more complex and sophisticated. More and more refinements were added to the thin red line so that an encyclopedic musical language developed. By the early 20th century, Stravinsky was stretching the orchestral score to its limit by asking for multiple layers not just of melody, but simultaneous layered rhythms too. By the end of the 20th century, Western notation's grip on all the world's music seemed unstoppable. made available the world's most effective composing tool. Within a hundred or so years of his system's publication, we see for the first time the actual names of composers attached to music. For better or worse, music began to belong to certain people. Before, it had been a shared common currency, an endlessly recycled and repackaged commodity. Now it could become a permanent record, a one-off, a work of art. Music could transcend the moment, the person, the country, or the language, and be transported all by itself to another person in another country in another time and place, and still be that same piece of music. We can only guess what music sounded like to the ears of the Pharaoh Ramesses II or Antony and Cleopatra, but we can actually hold in our hands the music written during the reign of Richard the Lionheart or Napoleon Bonaparte, thanks to Guido. No other culture has ever managed to develop a notation like the Western model, even the otherwise musically sophisticated Chinese. The Chinese did have tablature, but tablature only tells you where to place your fingers on a stringed instrument. It hardly tells you anything about the actual music. Tablature was also used by the Western lute, a forerunner of the guitar. A modern form of tablature are guitar symbols for use in pop music. Here's a Jimi Hendrix song, Long Hot Summer Night. And there are also the chord names, C sus4, G7, or B. The thing about tablature, though, is it doesn't really tell you the rhythm, the speed, the feel, or even the tune of the song. It assumes you know the song you're playing already. It's just jogging your memory, a bit like neumes in that respect. And so Guido's lined notation, just as it took over from Neumes, has swept the planet as the only completely accurate way of writing down the composer's precise intention. All manner of music of other cultures has now been translated into Western notation. Even in jazz, whenever composers wanted to create bigger or more ambitious structures, to specify exactly what notes the players should play, or to add many more instruments to their band, there was only one realistic option open to them, to use Guido's stave notation.
Sometimes, stave notation is exerting its influence on music that sounds like it's being made up on the spot. The apparently free-flowing, improvised sounds of a musician like Courtney Pine are made possible thanks to a musical template written down on Guido's trusty lines. J.S. Bach would have approved. track um, underground Can even though it sounds free there mm-hmm. is in fact quite a firm foundation there we're working from a theme uh, it's it's a based on three or four simple themes and they're tied together linked by an improvisation by the DJ so um, it's improvisatory in nature yes yeah. but there is definitely a structure to what we do if you do write something down mm-hmm. whether it's a, a series of chords or or the melody yes. it's really like a starting point very much so, yeah. I give the chords, I may give the melody and the accents, and that's it, and everybody's on their own. At some stage in your growth, mm. you had to learn all these chords and know exactly what they were. And Yeah, it's like Morse code, it's like a language. You have to have something that you can uh, communicate with other musicians. Learning how to sight read and going through the whole system, it's hard work, but it's essential if you're serious about music. In this scriptorium in Fontenay Abbey in Burgundy, medieval monks used to sit laboriously copying out countless books and music scores. Ultimately, the printing press rendered their painstaking artistry redundant. Powerful new technology in our own time, though, is going to make the changes wrought by mere printing seem like a tea party in comparison. Whilst some classically trained professional composers might still write all their scores out by hand, the overwhelming trend is for music to be transferred onto the page by another means altogether. Five years ago, I used to write out all my compositions in the old-fashioned way on lined manuscript paper, like all those thousands of composers in the past. 
Now I have the mighty Sibelius software to do it all for me. I can either input the notes onto the virtual score on the screen by this typewriter pad here, or I can simply play them in on this keyboard. And I can, if I want to, simply print it out as well. The thing is, wonderful though this instantly printed music looks, it is in fact rather inaccurate, or rather it's far too accurate, with lots of minute details I couldn't possibly understand if I were playing it at the piano. What the computer's written is exactly what I played, with all its human errors and subtleties included. A very simple piece of music has thus become an unnecessarily complicated piece of notation. Now this isn't a problem for me because I can edit these notes into a simple workable form that another musician could easily follow. But it would be a problem for a musician who hadn't been taught music the old-fashioned way, and a generation of composers are growing up far more dependent upon the computer to write their music for them. When old codgers like me are long gone, there is a danger there'll be very few people who know what the music should look like. They'll just be the computer's version of it. With all our amazing technology, we may be heading for a future rather like the situation these abbeys were in in the Dark Ages, where only a tiny minority of people were able to decode the complexities of musical language. Guido of Arezzo would have loved the Sibelius music software that I have in my studio. It would have made his job of codifying and filing the great repertoire of chants he managed every day of his life much, much easier. Instead, he had to develop a handwritten system that ultimately made possible the St. Matthew Passion, the Marriage of Figaro, and the Rite of Spring, not to mention Rhapsody in Blue or the Sinatra arrangements of Nelson Riddle. I believe it was our great good fortune that he did, because whatever happens next, written music's first millennium has been a fantastic adventure. <laughs>